Well, here's another quick update that took longer than I anticipated. One of the problems with curating a map is that they never stop growing. New lines and fiddly bits are added every day. So when I began illuminating the map of our closest star system, I should have known it would be a lifelong job. Our backyard will always have new grottos and glades to reveal. And this one's a doozy. Let's get the quick update done first. Planet Vulcan is dead. And honestly, I'm fine with it. For those not in the know, the planet Vulcan, desert home of Star Trek Spock, is canonically established to orbit the brightest star in the triple star system, 40 Eridani. In 2018, an actual planet was proposed to be orbiting just that star, except it was a super-Earth with a 42-day orbit. For all the hype about finding Vulcan, such a planet is too close to its star to be habitable. But now that 42-day signal has been revealed to almost certainly be due to stellar activity, and so the offending planet never actually existed, leaving Vulcan a tantalizing phantom yet to manifest. The big news involves another star in the constellation of Eridanus, E. Eridani, or 82.G Eridani, or HD20794. No one, it seems, can settle on what to call it, so I'll just do what I did when I first stumbled across it and pick the easiest choice to say aloud. E. Eridani, again, not to be confused with Epsilon Eridani, is a homey yellow G-type star, just slightly dimmer than the sun, and possibly twice as old, and so a mouth-watering prospect for possible planets. And in 2011, three purported planets were tentatively identified in orbit around it, all too close to be habitable. But in 2017, another study suggested three completely different planets, which, after a rush of studies in 2023, and a scouring of 20 years of data from radial velocity telescopes like HARPS and Espresso were finally confirmed in a paper released in January this year. The first planet, B, is a two-Earth mass planet orbiting its star at roughly a third the distance of Mercury. Whether it resembles that planet, or more likely, Venus, it is unlikely to be a pleasant locale. The second planet, C, is of roughly three Earth masses and lies roughly at Mercury's distance, and therefore likely resembles its closer sibling. The third planet, D, is why I am making this video. Another super-Earth of about six Earth masses, D has a wildly distended orbit. Its orbital eccentricity is 0 0.45, comparable to distant flailing dwarf planets like Eris or Gonggong. Its closest distance to its star is 0 0.75 AU, roughly that of Venus, but its farthest distance is 1.96 AU, which in our solar system would have it brushing the asteroid belt. But what is truly remarkable about this planet's orbit is that it spends 34% of its time within the star's habitable zone, the region at which liquid water can persist on its surface. This, of course, raises the question of whether D has a surface at all, a question which, because we have no planets of comparable mass in our solar system, is difficult to answer. Because D was discovered via radial velocity, the tug it gives its stars in orbits, we only know its mass, which places it exactly halfway between a terrestrial planet like Earth and an ice giant like Neptune. Which end of the spectrum it ultimately lies on is unknown, though it should be said that its mass is only a minimum. It could be considerably higher if its orbit were more inclined than assumed. The paper announcing the discovery has no time for speculation about what sort of climate or seasonal variation D might have. For that, it recommends another paper, published in April 2024, concerning a completely different planet around a completely different star. That star is Gliese 514, which, as seasoned followers of this series could probably tell from the name, is on the map, somewhere. Though in all honesty, I'm not sure where, because they haven't reached it yet. So consider this a detour. Gliese 514 is a fairly different prospect from E. Eridani. A bright red dwarf about half the mass of the sun, but only 4% is luminous, and, judging by its rotation period and surface activity, 
just 3.5 billion years old. However, like Eoridne, it is orbited by a super-Earth of roughly five Earth masses and an identical eccentricity of 45, which spends the same portion of its orbit, 34%, in its star's habitable zone. Like Eoridne d, Gliese 514b was discovered via radial velocity, and so at present we only know its mass. But unlike Eoridne d, someone attempted to model its climate. They found, unsurprisingly, that B's eccentricity had a more profound effect on its potential for habitability than any other factor, such as its axial tilt. Summer and winter have very different meanings on this world than they do on ours. And, thanks to Kepler's laws, B spends far more time in winter than in summer. Its periastron, 0.2 AU, is inside the orbit of Mercury, while its apastron, 0.6 AU, is slightly closer than Venus. But due to 514's far smaller luminosity, its planets receive far less installation than those in our system. At periastron, B receives about seven times the installation it receives at apastron. Habitability, it transpires, is a tough trick for our freewheeling planet. The team established an index based on seasonal surface temperature sufficient to maintain liquid water, and found that, initially at least, the numbers were forbidding. Because B is colder than Earth on average, higher ocean cover increases the likeliness of habitability because water absorbs and retains heat. Also, less sunlight means that less carbon dioxide gets trapped in the ground as carbonate, leading to a CO2-dominated atmosphere. For a purely CO2 atmosphere, habitability was only attained at a 6-atmosphere surface pressure and a 60% ocean cover. With the addition of 1% methane to the atmosphere, habitability expanded to 4 atmospheres of pressure and 50% ocean cover. Assuming 1% methane and 3.6 atmospheres of pressure, the planet would remain frozen from pole to pole during its orbital winter, and only just step out of freezing during periastral summer. Speaking as someone in London in February, the best they could hope for would be what I'm seeing right now. At 4.6 atmospheres, the planet becomes largely temperate, despite freezing over and seeing complete atmospheric collapse at the poles at Apastro increase the pressure to six atmospheres, and things become very different. The poles would remain icy in winter, but come periastron, the whole planet would be baking under a heat approaching 60 Celsius, the hottest temperature ever recorded on Earth. This is mitigated somewhat by the addition of a fast rotation period, which restricts the transfer of heat to the poles, and by the addition of a polar continent, which keeps polar temperatures cooler. They also found that a high axial tilt, like Uranus, could increase surface temperatures to habitable levels without the need for methane, provided the surface pressure remained above two atmospheres. If the pressure fell below two atmospheres, it could cause the equator to freeze. It is important not to draw too strong a parallel between these two stars. Gliese 514 is not Eoridne. If you watch my video on Proxima B, you will remember that red dwarfs have a vastly different effect on the climate of their orbiting planets than sun-like stars do, simply due to the distribution of light frequencies they emit. Also, Eoridne is far older than Gliese 514, meaning that Eoridne d has had three times as long to evolve. If we assume habitability, we must assume life, and life has remade our atmosphere in its own image. One of the earliest effects of this remaking was the eon-spanning ice age known as Snowball Earth. Who knows what travails this wild world has known?